right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Evgeny Filipov. I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Building the Future Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, we kicked off our strategic visioning process in 2017 and have been guided by five main strategic areas. These include automation, shaping resource flows, um, smart infrastructure finance, human habitat experience and adaptation, which is the focus of today's presentation. This is an exciting focus for our department and the profession as a whole. The virtual lecture series provides a forum for discussion of each strategic theme. It aims to build a broad community network that includes industry professionals, researchers, educations, and students. Through presentations from leading experts and panel discussions that provide new insights, the series explores a range of perspectives on the five strategic directions. We've had a lot of support to make this vision and today's presentation come together. We would like to especially thank our co-sponsors to this event. Those include the American Concrete Institute, ASC uh, Engineering Mechanics Institute, Graham Sustainability Center here at the University of Michigan, uh, the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, West Janey Elsner Associates. And I'd also like to thank our Strategic Implementation Committee um, and uh, all the staff that have made this possible. Uh, Mason, uh, Joyce, uh, Mark, thank you. So, um, where is our seminar today? Uh, for accessibility, we want to make uh, the event accessible to all participants. This webinar will have live automated captions and a transcript will be available. To choose a viewing option, click live transcript on the control bar at the bottom of your screen where you can show or hide subtitles or view the full transcript. Today, the distinguished lecture emphasizes the strategic theme of adaptation. To give an overview of this theme, I would like to play a two minute video. Adaptation is a necessary thing for survival. We're dealing with many things that are affecting our life. Climate change is essentially raising sea levels and that's going to affect coastal communities. It will cause more severe storms, more severe hurricanes and tornadoes that are becoming increasingly frequent and increasingly destructive. We are looking at how extreme events like hurricanes and earthquakes affect communities and how can these communities recover quickly from these different types of events. My colleague Evgeny Filipov he is looking at how origami can help us design structures that change shape, that respond to various types of hazards as they occur. My colleague Valery Ivanov, he is looking in the Amazon at how trees interact together and how they grow within that environment. My work is focused a lot on earthquake engineering. If we do not build our structures to be resistant to earthquakes, we are going to get structures that would fail in a catastrophic manner we will always be adapting to new stressors that will appear on the horizon. We just don't know what they are yet. Through human ingenuity, we will always be able to adapt to whatever situation exists. So during the lecture and panel discussion, I invite participants to send in questions using the Q&A function. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, both from those from our in-person audience as well as our online questions. And now I'd like to introduce our very special speaker and their panelists. We're very fortunate to have Franz Bohn, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who will speak to us on the topic of can we engineer the energy transition, the science and engineering of bulk energy storage and concrete structures. The presentation by Franz will be followed by a panel discussion with our distinguished panelists, Ryan Culligan and Lindsay Kirkus. Ryan is a design principal at Skidmore Owings and Merrill, and Lindsay is an environmental and infrastructure engineer at Southeast Michigan Council of Governments. This brings us to today's distinguished lecture. Let me now invite Franz to speak on the theme and give his presentation. Help me welcome in Franz. Thank you very much for uh, having me uh, here in Michigan. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Um, while not far away from here, there's uh, some picket lines, people on strike. So I want to acknowledge that and wish them good luck. But because they built part of our future, I want to talk today about how to engineer the uh, uh, energy uh, transition. Or more generally, can we actually store energy in concrete uh, of the, uh, for uh, this purpose? Now, okay, so 
Okay, okay. So so let's get started of um, of what is actually the, the the challenge of of energy storage. The problem of renewable energies is that the energy source and the energy carrier are not in the same place. In contrast to fossil fuel, when you have a gallon of uh, oil, you take it from one place to the other, you have both the energy source and the carrier at the same place. It's different when you talk about renewable energies, where you have the energy carrier being the electrons, um, but you need to store it somewhere in order to make it use. So this separation actually uh, is at the, one of the biggest challenge of transitioning um, uh, uh, forward. So if you look at uh, non-renewable energies, you have always this unity of demand and supply at the point that was the whole system of bringing fossil fuel uh, in, our, um, in our homes, into our vehicles, uh, et cetera. Now, when you talk about the renewable energies, whether this is uh, uh, from solar, from wind, tidal waves, uh, etc. You need a medium of storing uh, uh, this energy in order to match demand with uh, uh, supply. So, um, but how is energy currently stored? Actually, it is used. The classical technology are batteries. So batteries uh, use this uh, renewable energy. So the electrons uh, take electrical energy, transform it into chemical energy, and then bring it back when we need it into uh, electrical energy. So that's how batteries work. But the constituents in order to achieve those batteries exist only in uh, very selective places, one, and it is uh, not available for everyone so that we can scale energy uh, storage for everyone and everywhere. That's a, a, a key problem. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is um, if we think about concrete, concrete is right now perceived very often as a problem actually because uh, the production of uh, uh, concrete or cement in particular, um, there's a huge amount of CO2 which goes into the production actually uh, some numbers put it as high as 8% of the worldwide produced CO2 production, um, which is not a sustainable technology if we think about the 21st uh, century. Now, many people are working on this problem and the, the way how uh, most people are working on this here is by replacing some clinker faces uh, by some alternatives or doing more with less. Uh, maybe fuel uh, uh, substitution, there's a uh, sometimes increased thermal uh, efficiency, the less is more by design, improved longevity, uh, and eventually some carbon capture and storage. Um, however, uh, even that here would not be enough to reduce the CO2 uh, impact and would make concrete uh, or cement production a problem for the future as we go along. So which is why came the idea of let's add another function to the material which forms the backbone of our society's uh, need uh, for shelter, infrastructure, transportation, adding here uh, a new property, which is electron conductivity uh, to the system. But let's get real. Electron conductivity, um, concrete is strong, everybody can make it, uh, and it has a huge environmental footprint, but it's an insulator in the first place, meaning it cannot conduct uh, electrons unless you have some some uh, electrolyte in the solution, you get a little bit of electron uh, of uh, uh, electron conductivity in the system, but when it's dry, it's an insulator. So how can we add actually this function uh, to the material? Well, we need another component. The component which we're using is nanocarbon black. Nanocarbon black, which uh, um, is uh, a relatively cheap material, uh, now we'll come back to it, how it is produced. We mix it up with uh, Portland cement, uh, put some uh, super plus size in there, uh, water, and then we obtain <laughs> the carbon black uh, cement uh, uh, composites. Now, what is really fascinating about uh, this material is the magic of chemistry. In fact, um, 
But uh, when you put uh, carbon black as a hydrophobic material in water, it clumps. It's held together by the forces of water um, uh, and uh, it clumps. So it, nothing happens with this material. In return, when you add cement to it, which is hydrophilic, consuming in the course of hydration, the same water in the alkaline environment of uh, concrete wells, then you have this uh, volumetric wire permeating um, a, a load-bearing cement-based uh, matrix. Um, and uh, because it's a chemically driven process, everyone can do it. You just need to mix up carbon black with cement and water in order to obtain uh, this uh, uh, material. In fact, uh, what you can then actually show is that uh, this uh, uh, carbon black type material, carbon black here, permeates this um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the material uh, in a space filling way at all different length scales, almost uh, like a fractal in a, fr a fractal system here with uh, carbon uh, being everywhere. And in between, as you can see here, these Raman uh, pictures, you um, find out that uh, you can achieve electron connectivity uh, with this uh, material. Now, what happens if you add here carbon black to it at a relatively low uh, um, a percentage, then you see the resistivity, which is the inverse of electron conductivity. The resistivity of a normal carbon black here goes down here at a percolation threshold of uh, here by weight percent, 2.5% by volume percent, between three and 4%. You have this percolated network permeating the entire material uh, going down how many orders of magnitude? One, two, three, four, five, six orders of magnitude. You drop the, um, the electron, uh, the, the resistivity of the material and gaining the, uh, um, uh, uh, the connectivity. Now, where does, that, uh, where does that material figure? Concrete, you have here the resistivity. See, typically here is concrete, brick, Porcelain, and if you now add in this uh, with this relatively cheap material, carbon black, you increase a little bit the cost, but just marginally, in order to achieve here uh, a good conductive behavior in a volumetric uh, uh, sense. Here, and uh, the type of application you can then think about it is well, because of the hydrophobicity, you can get sort of a higher free stall resistance because of. Uh, the hydrophobicity of the surface internally and externally. Um, you can use it uh, uh, like a stove plate for Joule effect. You can use it for energy storage, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And uh, if you are um, um, interested in uh, shielding military structure, data storage, etc., one can make uh, uh, high power electromagnetic uh, shielding. Uh, uh, because of the uh, properties uh, of the material. Today, I'm only focusing on this, uh, on these two applications here. And the first application is self-heating. I think it's a timely topic because it's getting cold in Michigan uh, again. Well, what can you do with this uh, material? In fact, if you see, look here, if you put such a material between two uh, conductive plates and then put a positive and a negative charge, on two sides and measure the temperature, you actually see that as you increase the voltage, the temperature actually scales with the voltage to the power two, which provides a highly accurate way of monitoring the energy, the so-called Joule effect, uh, um, the heat uh, release uh, by means of uh, 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 just charging um, like an electric stove, the material. That's a dissipative process, which takes place at a relatively uh, a small scale. And this is able, you can scale this actually very neatly. You know, these are sort of uh, some lab examples for some sidewalks uh, uh, in tile format, you know, where we connect them here to uh, 0 volt, 12 volt, 24 volt, 12 uh, volts, just to see how that uh, operates. You can, hi it's highly repetitive, uh, the system here. And then when you uh, look uh, at uh, the temperature rise, you see how homogeneous the temperature rise actually occurs in the system. So if you want to get rid of the shuffle or, this, uh, or the salt on your roads, here's concrete for self-heating 
um, applications, all what you need to do is to connect it to, um, to uh, a voltage source, positive, negative charge. And uh, by controlling the voltage, you control the temperature with high accuracy, but scaling it here with voltage uh, to the power two. And you see how homogeneous that is. Applications here, we are not the first one. There has been other people who have tried this a long time before with uh, steel fibers or steel shavings uh, on tarmacs, uh, etc. With one great advantage here, because we have the cable everywhere, uh, we get a much higher electron, uh, 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 electron conductivity. The electron conductivity enables us to spread the uh, to uh, create this volumetric heat source in a straightforward uh, manner. You can also think about this here for radiant heat application. Um, again, uh, the, the problem here is defined here. What you need here is sort of a design requirement, once in 15 watts per square foot. Um, then uh, there is three parameters which you are working on. So one is a structural parameter, which is sort of a thickness of a length. Uh, real length square real, uh, uh, ratio, which talks about the heat uh, propagation within uh, the slab. Then you talk about uh, the control parameter, which is voltage to the power two, which you can fine tune highly accurately. And then here comes the material sign uh, uh, design in, here in order to monitor this resistive heating by merely four or five percent of uh, with. Uh, with uh, the cheapest possible carbon black, which you can get uh, on the market. But let's come to energy storage, because I think that's uh, where uh, we want to discuss uh, today about. Uh, already discussed why now, why do we need to shift here to uh, green energy uh, uh, and that it requires energy storage solutions and structures um, as an example here uh, for this purpose. So. This is not batteries, what we are talking about. What we are talking about is a uh, supercapacitor. Now, I don't expect that anybody here needs to know the details about supercapacitor, but it's a very important to know the difference with batteries. In contrast to batteries, where you transfer electrical energy into chemical energy and vice versa, which is the reason why after a couple of hundreds or maybe a thousand cycles, your uh, battery uh, dies down, Supercapacitor work uh, slightly different. In the simple scheme, you see here you have two electrodes, so two metallic plates in the classical way, um, which you charge one positive, the other one negative. What then happens is counter ions of an electrolyte salt solution, which is in between these uh, two plates, the uh, counter ions move here. So if this is a positively charged electrode, negative ions move to the surface and stick onto it on the entire surface. And the same happens on the other side. The fact that there's a separator in between, which lets electrolyte go through, but no electrons, um, creates a discharge separation. And by doing so, you, cho you charge energy. In the moment when you disconnect, uh, so discharge, when you disconnect these electrodes from this positive negative charge, the ions will go back into the solution and um, uh, uh, as such, uh, you can discharge the energy uh, into appliances, uh, et cetera. Now in our materials, we do not have plates. What we have is this volumetric wire, which is everywhere. So we have this huge specific surface, surf, surface actually of our materials to store this energy, which as we showed, um, scales with the volume of the material. In the moment when you have made it, bringing this hydrophobic material into this alkaline hydrophilic environment of cement and that it um, uh, hydrate. So that's what you need there is, well, the electron conductive uh, cable, which is basically our volumetric wire. What you need is the porosity, which is naturally created in cement-based materials. Um, and you need a large enough uh, specific surface in the carbon black, the so-called storage porosity, in order to store along this volumetric cable all uh, the energy needed. Now, this is not just an idea. I'll show you here an example here. You see here one electrode, so I have here uh, the positive charge, you have here the negative charge. 
Um, this is just uh, here, this part to hold the two uh, uh, electrodes uh, together. In between, you have a separator, in essence, a newspaper, which you put in between. And uh, then you can store um, energy into uh, the system. Uh, so just to hear sort of how that looks like, uh, you, you have here the samples, two samples, the fiber separator, and then you have uh, some conductive graphitic paper to bring in uh, with an electron, uh, with uh, to bring in the uh, electricity, you connect this year positive negative charge, and uh, you all set to charge uh, the system. Now, this is sort of typical results uh, from electrochemical testing here, a test in which we impose the voltage up to one volt, you never use more than one volt because of uh, uh, the electrolyte, the salt solution, which is water-based. You don't want the water to split into hydrogen and oxygen uh, in your material, so you never go above uh, one volt. And uh, the area here is basically a measurement of, um, in this uh, uh, plot here where you charge, discharge, the area is a measurement of the storage capacity uh, of the system. Now, as engineers, I want you to think about it, to forget about that this is current as and, and voltage, just think about this here, that this would be a stress and this would be a strain, then you have exactly the same mathematical framework as we classically engineers deal with crude behavior of uh, uh, material. But what we're able to show them here, that we basically get something like uh, uh, one kilojoule per kilogram of material inside the system. And if we scale this with the cement paste in concrete, we would need on the order of 40 cube meter of uh, this type of concrete for the daily consumption of 10 kilowatt hours uh, um, uh, of, a, of a home. So from that point of view, uh, we make use here uh, from this porosity. Uh, so that's the 3D porous network and cement based materials for the electrolyte. And uh, we use uh, the, uh, uh, as the transport porosity and we use the carbon black as storage uh, uh, porosity. And here is the key point, one of the key scaling relationship here about it is that this energy storage capacity expressed here by this quantity, which is capacitance, um, uh, scales with the specific surface of the carbon black linearly. These are all type of tests uh, with different thickness, different water cement ratios, different types of carbon black. And you see here, that you are able to scale this here by merely choosing the specific surface inside the material independent of the volume, meaning you have an intensive quantity here identified, uh, but with which you can work in order to scale the material. Let's, let's see that not everything uh, works so well because in the moment if you add um, a hydrophobic phase into a hydrophilic environment which creates cohesive bonds, which gives the strength of the materials, well, you reduce the strength of the material to some extent, meaning that if you uh, uh, increase, if you want to add, store more energy, no, if you want to store faster the energy, you need to have a larger pore space for the electrolyte to reach the carbon black. As a consequence, the strength here goes down here. This is materials with different water cement ratio. And here is the energy storage on the other hand goes up. So there exists actually inside these materials a sweet spot, which needs to be optimized for all type of uh, applications. Here sort of, this is a beautiful test, which uh, actually everybody can try. The, uh, sorry, uh, this is the wrong direction. Um, so what, we, what is shown here in this image is a photovoltaic cell, small one, which can I think charge up to three volts or something. You just connect it here to, uh, a number of supercapacitors which are put in series here. And uh, uh, then you let it charge five seconds, 10 seconds. And then you take it off and uh, uh, an LED goes on at this uh, small level. So these are put uh, 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 in series. Now, why in series? Well, in series is sort of um, a very interesting uh, uh, point that the energy storage actually scales with the voltage to uh, the power two, and what you can actually create then here is sort of a 
12 volt battery, you see here 12 supercapacitors in series. So one layer, uh, a separator, another electrode, um, uh, a conductive paper, etc. Once you start stacking these Oreos up in a column, well, uh, you get uh, basically your 12 volt equivalent battery type behavior with uh, uh, just a very, very small scale. Now, what is that here uh, for? The, I, the idea here is basically columns is one of the reference systems in, uh, in civil engineering structures. So if you, our calculations show that about this size of uh, height of a column uh, filled up with supercapacitors uh, allows you to charge an iPhone. If you take a column uh, sort of three meter 60 uh, uh, height, you're able to store the energy for a fridge and so on. And then you start scaling it all the way to uh, structural uh, application. But let there be no doubt. We're just in the beginning of this year, right? We know now how the material behaves, still working to optimize the, the, the rheology of the materials. The key question really is how will the structures of the future look like? Will they be uh, brick by brick? We're going to build yeah, the energy storage, each one of them being uh, uh, one of these 12 volt batteries, which we build in our buildings. Or will it be uh, for uh, self-charging roads where we charge our roads similar as we charge our phones wirelessly in, um, uh, uh, in our cars when we ride? By the way, this is a very specific application the way how it works actually is that you need two electric fields, one electric field in the pavement generated through our electron conductive materials, one electric field in the car, which already exists in all electric cars. And uh, then by, electrom, uh, by the orthogonality of magnetism versus the electric field, you by electromagnetic induction, we transfer charge. What it requires is high frequency, much higher the frequency that the AC, which we have, uh, right now in our system. Energy storage for uh, wind, for uh, a, 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 any type of renewable energy here requires of course also higher strength. So here we open up for discussion a, a material which we hope um, many people will try out, will work around optimize on the different scales, from the material scale to get higher strength materials, specifically for wind application and maybe for uh, high end uh, bridge uh, uh, strength applications, all the way to optimizations of uh, structures to, to have multifunctional structures, structures which not only can carry loads, but carry as well, uh, but uh, have also the ability of storing energy and storing that energy fast and reliably. With this, I thank you very much for your attention and happy to jump into questions as they come along. Thank you. Thank you so much for the for the wonderful talk. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite our panel to come up here, and we'll have this uh, uh, nice uh, discussion about uh, uh, the future of uh, of uh, engineering and energy storage in our in our systems. Uh, if you'd like to uh, take a seat, we've already received some questions from our online audience. Uh, but what I'd like to do is maybe start with our in-person audience and uh, see if we have uh, uh, well. Even before that, what I'd like to do is uh, maybe get uh, some thoughts and uh, discussion from the panel. Uh, we'll start with some quick introductions on, from uh, Ryan and then uh, Lindsay uh, on your work uh, and uh, what you see as, as the frontier in, in this, this area. Uh, Ryan? So it's good to meet you all. My name is Ryan Culligan. I'm an architect, uh, the design principal at a firm called Skin Rockwings and Merrill. We do uh, projects of all types, sizes, scales, programs around the world. Uh, I personally worked on maybe 15 to 20 projects at a time uh, in both the United States, civic projects, so related to airport design, towers, uh, both neighborhoods, uh, architectural and master plan and scale. A lot of my work recently is international in the developing world and in places that are changing and growing most rapidly. 
So I was listening to the presentation just now. I was thinking about a project that I worked on recently uh, that is under construction. It's in Bangkok. And it is a, a neighborhood that is designed and built all at once for a, a daily population of 200,000 people. There is an enormous amount of concrete that is used in construction. It's the most ubiquitous material. For this project, uh, it is all concrete. It has the single largest concrete map for in human history. It's 24,000 cubic meters of concrete that went into just the foundation of that. So think about the metrics that I was just talking about. One column powers one refrigerator in Bangkok, the sun, lots of building integrated photovoltaics in our designs on our roofs and facades. If we had used uh, what was just presented in our basements, in our building structures, the degree to which our structure could act in a multifunctional way to drive down the unnecessary um, crack that is in so many buildings, it would have huge scalable impact. My focus in general is on trying to find ways to either reduce materials with conventional systems, dropping down the materials in our beams or their slabs, or finding ways for materials to serve multiple functions. And I can talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Ryan. Lindsay? Yeah. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Lindsay Kirkes. I'm an engineer with the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments. Um, so the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, or SEMCOV, is the regional municipal planning organization. We cover the seven county region in uh, Metro Detroit, that includes Ann Arbor, uh, nearly 20 other, 200 other communities. Um, one of our primary roles is to really bring the federal transportation dollars and other federal funding to local agencies. Um, so I'm in our environmental group. Most of my work is really involved in inventorying and mitigating climate pollution, um, as well as increasing our resilience. I'm working right now on a climate action plan for the region. Um, this is coming through EPA. Um, and for this regional climate action plan, getting projects included in this plan and is the first step in unlocking kind of the federal dollars through Inflation Reduction Act and other programs. Um, so I think that is a key that understanding these programs and having things implementation ready can really bring in that federal funding that's out there right now. And there is a lot of federal funding. So it's it's just matching up the municipality and the program and, and getting the money through to do these projects. I think, um, you know, with the new administration, everybody is ready to think about more transformative, um, ambitious projects to help with climate pollution and mitigating climate change. So I, I'm excited to see these more innovative projects uh, while knowing that, you know, we kind of talked about this a little earlier, our municipalities and many of the federal agencies are, are kind of risk averse when it comes to new technology. So thinking about how we can bring those together and maybe use some of these grant funding dollars to bring these programs in and think about that as a next step. Thank you, Lindsay. So uh, welcome. If there's uh, any questions, uh, Glenn. Glenn Diger with the uh, University of Michigan here. Looking for kind of uh, the engineer's uh, uh, first order of magnitude calculation. So if someone knows how much battery capacity would be needed uh, so that we can be totally dependent on renewable sources. Uh, so my question is, compared to that, if we, if we had this in all of our structures, is this a 1% solution? Is it a 100% solution, a 500% solution? If you understand my question. So how much could we store relative to how much storage we need? It's an excellent, excellent question. And uh, uh, I don't want to overblow it, but sort of the idea is one foundation of the homes, which I saw sort of a single dwelling would be enough to have enough energy for this home if it was completely energy autarkic. So um, you may, and 10 kilowatt uh, hours, and some people say that 10 kilowatt hours is sort of a European measurement that in the US you have more sort of 30 kilowatt hours because <laughs> much larger, I take this criticism. Um, 
uh, but I, I think uh, it would be with the current energy consumption foundation would cover 50% if it is 30, if, it, if we take the 30 kilowatt hours for, uh, uh, for the building. Now, let, let, me, let there be no doubt, it's, um, uh, it is feasible because it scales by volume. But the engineering starts now, because you ask the question as an engineer, you have to ask in which form will that come? Do I just uh, pour the material? It needs to be, it's a little bit more sophisticated, but not that much more sophisticated. It needs here to think structures through, not only from a strength perspective or shelter perspective, from sort of the normal function which we have with concrete, but you need to think it through as well from an energy storage perspective. And that's actually the most fascinating thing about this material, because out of a sudden you play no more in just a structural engineering world. You not only play in an electrical engineering world. You play not. You play actually in a world where these different parts need to come together in order to uh, create a multifunctional design and operation. Mm -hmm. We'll say Americans can adapt. We just don't like to. <laughs> yeah, hi, my, my name is Sharif Altawil. I'm a, in the structures group and I have interest in materials as well. So thank you very much for a really intriguing presentation. Um, I am curious though, most concrete structures have reinforcement in them and they have steel fibers or carbon fibers. So I assume the fibers are not a problem, but the steel reinforcement because it pervades the entire volume, how does that affect the ability to store energy and discharge it when needed. Yeah, so uh, there, there, there are quite a few uh, questions in this embedded. So the first one is, if you have any type of reinforcement, steel-based reinforcement, you need to make sure that the electrolyte, the salt solution you're using, is compatible with to avoid corrosion. So you may want to move away from uh, uh, the KCL solution, which we use in our labs right now. But there, these are sort of the smaller problems. The second one is, of course, if you have uh, two electrodes by a separator and you have a reinforcement going through, you basically don't have any more charge separation. And so, and here comes the, this design. So the layout of, even of the reinforcement layout will need to factor in the functionality the electrochemical functionality of the material. <clears throat> so for instance, you could imagine if you have a column and you have typically the reinforcement on the outside, right? You know, the, the, the stirrups and uh, the, the, uh, the vertical one, you have them on the outside with a concrete cover. And then in the core of it, you store the, uh, the, the supercapacitor technology. So what I mean by this is, again, you need to, in the design, in the layout, all the way to the detailing of the construction drawings, you need to consider uh, uh, the multifunctionality of the solution. And I know this is not straightforward. We have not been trained as structural engineers, and I am one, in this uh, thinking that yeah. So it is a new way of, well, thinking out of our box as structural engineers, as uh, uh, concrete engineers, as, uh, as builders, and uh, take it to the next level. And the same thing applies also to architectural structures, right? You know, that uh, how do you, what is the meaning of multifunctionality from an architectural perspective, uh, uh, which optimizes uh, uh, surfaces, um, photovoltaic cells built already into the windows, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, if we want to get real with the energy transition, we need to open up and lead that change through design, through multifunctional thinking. Hey, I'm Sabine Los. Uh, I'm also a professor here in civil and environmental. I am uh, not a materials person really, or an energy person, but I'm a big fan of renewable energy. And I have a question for you about kind of this new technology. So my understanding is that 
there are a lot of different competing technologies for energy storage. So you have kind of short duration, you know, less than eight hours of storage, and that's dominated by lithium ion. And then you have long duration, which is kind of a lot of different technologies like hydrogen, solid state, or flow batteries. So I'm wondering, now that you're introducing kind of concrete into this whole mix of all of these other competing technologies for storage, and you introduced a lot of different applications, right, too, like the um, kind of um, charging EVs versus um, the energy transition of the grid, where does concrete fit in compared to those other technologies? Is it is it good for long duration? Is it good for energy density? So the technology of supercapacitor, which by the way is in any electric car, right? You know, you break, stores the energy in there before it goes into the battery. Um, uh, the technology actually is based on diffusion processes which means that the storage, the time to storage is driven by the characteristics of the diffusion process, typically the thickness to the power tool. So your question, and the same thing applies, by the way, to the spontaneous discharge as well as to, uh, well, to the, to the uh, applied uh, uh, load there. So the, the charge time in essence is something which you can design by choosing the thickness of it. So if you want to have, Five second charge, that's what we do with uh, sort of the one millimeter thick electrodes. And if we want, if you want to have uh, uh, it scales with the power of uh, two, you want to have, uh, you make it one centimeter thick, that means it takes 500 seconds. So now you already sp speak in the minute range, right? Now you're talking about uh, from one centimeter, you go to 10 centimeters. Now you go up to the next level. What I mean by this here, <laughs> through the design of those electrode system that you have this variety of it. Now you will say, okay, everybody who ever worked with concrete will tell you, you know, one millimeter type concrete doesn't exist. I agree with that here, right? In construction, every, you know, half an inch is, is, uh, is sort of the, the, the measurement of, uh, of accuracy. But what I mean by this is that means that there are technologies which are required in order to engineer the time scales. So if you want to have these very fine thin, maybe you have to go towards additive manufacturing techn technology, like 3D printing, in order to get these fine layers, et cetera. So it's, a, it's a, the, because of the versatility of the material, which means you can produce different thickness, you can actually monitor the time scale or design into the structure, the time scale, which you need. You can get to a size large enough for like eight hours of storage. If, for instance, if you think about a home where you have the whole day to charge the electricity uh, into the uh, into the wall system, yeah. you can design something for a twelve hour or whatever type storage uh, you look uh, for. Um, if you want to have it for wind applications, where you're sort of in the from the second to the minute range because of the spikes uh, which you get there, you're going to use other thickness. Oh, what I mean by this, the engineering really starts now. You know, now there's ideas out there we, we can do our small little thing in the lab. Now starts the engineering. It means that's why I'm going around and came here, you know, to show you that here and invite you, let's say, to embark with us on this journey to make concrete part of the solution for the future. So I've got a question to follow up on this. Uh, maybe a difficult one and open for the panel. Um, and there's probably a few parts to this question as well, but the gist of it is who pays for this decarbonization? You know, is it municipal governments? Is it big government? Is it companies? Um, where where do we go in terms of funding? Right, these are novel technologies that are expensive, to, at least to start off, and uh, could pay off. Uh, but uh, maybe we could start with this for the panelists on opinions of who pays. So, you know, kind of alluded to this earlier, I think uh, municipal governments can be very risk averse. They want to be good stewards of tax dollars. So that can, you know, really make them uh, hesitant to go for new technologies. One thing that I think they can do uh, that would help if there were more commercial applications, you know, to remove any barriers in terms of codes or 
you know, ordinances that would enable these technologies and make it a lot easier for, you know, if a building wanted to do something like this. You know, I have heard a lot of municipal governments, including the city of Detroit, talking about self-charging roads for electric vehicles. So I do think that those ideas are out there and people are open to it. Um, there are lots of different programs through uh, federal highway and federal government, but the key is going to be finding the right application and writing a compelling case to get that grant funding. And I think that's a way that people may be able to bring in applications that are more innovative on the municipal side. I have very strong opinions about this, and I agree with everything you said. Um, I have I brought exposure to uh, yeah, <laughs> to you know for profit construction endeavors um, uh, with developers, with municipal government, sometimes with federal governments. Um, in my experience, and this is uh, federal governments and the dollars um, money that is set aside in large scale development creates greater distance typically between uh, uh, cost and profit uh, than developers and municipal governments, meaning uh, uh, oftentimes, unless the federal government of a given country is directing, the profit margins are raised with it. You might not think that about most buildings, but very few percentage points are between how much a building costs and how much it's selling. And so if you want to be persuasive in getting decarbonizing technologies incorporated into your buildings when you're working with cities, with developers, almost always, unless you find a special client that is just, you know, uh, got a point of view that uh, uh, they have, uh, you need to be persuasive with a win-win proposition where something is decarbonizing and cheaper. Okay. And that's why it is so important to find uh, architectural instruction means and methods that do more than one thing. I'm going to talk just for a second. More. Put this into kind of relief. People talk a little bit about numbers and about you know, the rising climate crisis. And you know, uh, numbers can be persuasive, but for me, it is sometimes more instructive to think almost immediately. Okay. So for the next 40 years, uh, it, is, uh, it is expected that over 2 trillion square feet of construction will happen in the next okay. uh, Visually, what that means over the next 40 years is that above a New York City full of area will drop down onto Earth every month. Okay. So for 40 years, a new, York, new, a new New York City every month. Think about all of the materials that go into each of those cities. Okay. So you want to have scalable impact and get it affordable. You need to find ways to allow for the materials that you need to have to do more things. Okay. Uh, building enclosures is one example. Prevailing um, uh, uh, technology for high-rise construction right now is something called third. You all know what a third wall is. Third wall is a unitized system that allows for in a factory a unit to be built that assembles glazing, typically some type of insulator and mullions that snap together on site very quickly with high degree. It's usually a mullion associated with these curtain walls that hang off of building slabs. These mullions are four inches to five inches wide, maybe 10 inches in depth. They're almost always on the inside of the structure. Outside of the structure, then when you have a lot of glass, you need to have shade. <clears throat> They're more comfortable. You want to have better solar panels, better energy panels. One of the things that we, as a construction industry, is looking at is ways in which those mullions can be pulled from the inside out. So you still have the structural performance of the mullion, which stands the wind loads that these buildings need to withstand. But those mullions all of a sudden will do, do dual benefit to shade the building as well. So you can basically reduce an entire system off of the building. And that's the promise of something like this. Concrete, you can figure out a way for it to do more than all of a sudden clients, <laughs> or governments, have to pay less for storage. You can find a way basically to save money by having things do more. That, that is the way you get basically you decarbonize, decarbonization. Thank you, Brian. This uh, goes along with maybe the next question that's quite related, I think. So, you know, we talk a lot about carbon taxes and, you know, the, the, this technology in particular has, the, you know, 
it's a double-edged sword, right? You are still, you know, using carbon and you are um, emitting carbon to, to create this technology. How does this change? How does this change? And what is the equation that maybe needs to get used when you're considering this, these types of technologies? So it's a, this is a question which uh, uh, needs to refer to uh, life cycle analysis uh, um, and the concept of avoided emissions. Yeah. So uh, let's take it this way. You still use cement. You could also use any type of uh, uh, cleaner, greener cement, uh, which loves water, which is hydrophilic, reacting with the hydrophobic phase. So that could be a way of reducing the carbon intensity, if need be, for this purpose. But now think it one step further. If you have a self-charging road, and I'll work back, you have a self-charging road, which charges an electric vehicle, so which avoids uh, paying the, what is it, $4 now the gallon, um, uh, uh, um, on the pump, plus releasing all the CO2, number one. The amount of avoided emissions there will, after a relatively short time, will compensate for anything what you put initially as embedded footprint into the material. You do more with the uh, material uh, uh, than uh, you do right now, where you only look at uh, one behavior, which is an important one, shelter, strength, etc. And then think about the carbon black. How is the carbon black produced? Actually, the most advanced way how carbon black is produced is uh, by using methane. Methane, as you know, has a, a, a global warming potential which has 30 to 50 times higher than CO2. So, uh, and it is often released in uh, shale gas operation. It's sort of the cheap part of it, even though people are trying now to use it. But people do use methane actually in order to separate it into hydrogen. For, for hydrogen and the carbon. But the carbon right now is thrown away, but actually that's carbon black. So imagine you take methane, which has this worst effect of, uh, uh, um, of uh, uh, killing our, uh, our uh, uh, ozone layers. Um, you use this methane and separate it into an energy source, hydrogen, and you get the carbon black for the material, which becomes energy storage system. Out of a sudden you speak about a complete other equation of, uh, uh, of uh, the closed uh, uh, loop recycled uh, uh, material for clean energy. It needs to adapt the life cycle uh, perspective uh, rather than having just sort of the focus of uh, the 8% worldwide uh, CO2 emissions associated with uh, cement. Thank you. So just to ask if there's one, we can take maybe one more question from the audience and uh, maybe we'll do two, but quick questions and quick answers, we we'll hope. So maybe David. Yeah, David Kelly in the civil engineering department, um, focused primarily on construction. So um, in the course of your research, have you found anything or ever looked at any sort of adaptive technology that would serve to take existing concrete and have that serve as a as a battery source and taking advantage of what's already in place as opposed to you know pouring all new concrete that this has anything in your research led you to believe that that's a possibility uh, yeah we looked at it but uh, didn't, didn't so didn't find having said this having said this uh, uh it's actually relatively easy to make a relatively thin layered system on existing concrete so use it actually as a substrate, for instance, for self-heating walkways, sidewalks. You need a relatively small layer, work out the interfaces so you can, you can add it to it. We have not found a way how to inject carbon or into the system, you know, in order to create this, uh, uh, this uh, conductive uh, material, unfortunately. I, but point is well taken here. Yeah. There we go. Jeremy, maybe? Jeremy Bricker, also from the Civil Engineering Department. Um, I have two questions. One is, and if you've already covered this in your presentation, I missed the very beginning, I'm sorry. Uh, what's the round trip efficiency of this technology? And the second is, um, how does it affect the lifetime of the concrete? Round trip efficiency? Lifetime of the concrete. 
Okay, so um, so when we speak about lifetime, we need to think about two lifetimes, right? You have the charging, charge discharge behavior, and uh, uh, then you have the durability of the concrete. So uh, uh, that's still ongoing work in order to find one measurement, let's say for both, which bring together. So we have run cyclic uh, uh, tests, of course, on these materials. We have run up to 30,000 uh, cycles on the material. So uh, until 12,000, 13,000, we were relatively, we were always at the same efficiency of about 95% when it comes to columbic efficiency and retainment of the energy storage capacity. Afterwards it dropped, but it dropped most likely because the cell let the electrolyte go out. So if you take this sort of 12,000, it's only order of um, 35 years if each cycle is one day. So 35 years for, for from the energy storage perspective. The other question which you raise is the question about the uh, uh, durability in, on, in the environment, which is with regard to strength behavior, given that we have need a higher porosity, typically operating at water salmon ratio of 0 seven, meaning we have a higher water, uh, a, a higher porosity, and with this here, the risk of ingression of something from the outside. Well, our electrolytes, the good news is we insulate them so that the electrolyte cannot go to the outside. So that means, however, that you need a protective layer, a little bit like the concrete cover, same way, far away from this here, so that you insulate actually the supercapacitor technology from the outside. Um, have we, I haven't looked yet on uh, the problem of temperature cycle behavior. Um, it doesn't come from the inside because the voltage is relatively low, so the Joule effect is relatively small. Uh, but thermal behavior is, of course, a, an issue if you go from minus 40, plus 40, you need to check this out, how that uh, behavior, uh, how will that affect particularly the electrolyte behavior? And then, uh, of course, the coupling with mechanics. So that's ongoing things in order to make it fit for the application where you look for them. Thank you. We're out of time. So I think we're at the end of time. There's a lot of questions that are still coming in online and, and uh, some other questions that have come in. Um, so unfortunately, we won't be able to get to those. So I'd encourage if, if uh, anybody wants more uh, clarification or answers or discussing some of the big picture questions, um, contact, uh, myself, the panelists, I think are, are much more uh, well equipped to discuss this, but I'm really glad that we had this very exciting discussion here. Uh, and I thank uh, uh, our speaker, Franz, uh, Ryan and Lindsay for uh, their participation on the panel. Uh, thank you. And, and I hope uh, you can help me in thanking the, the speakers here today. Thank you.